Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Kevin. I'm Max. And we're here on another deep dive in pulmonary pathology. So we've been doing this uh, following our 25 top pearls of pulmonary pathology, which was a pretty successful program. Uh, we rolled it out over how many months, uh, Max? Six months? Uh, about six months, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to try to do this over the next uh, six months to a year. We're going to try to explore all the areas of pathology that, that are kind of like the neglected children. Um, we all know about them, but we might be a little afraid to venture down that dark alley uh, of that disease grouping uh, that we might, like vascular diseases, which is what we're our topic today. Max, what do you want to tell us about this particular deep dive series? That's right. So this particular series, we're talking about approach to pulmonary vascular lesions, and we've assembled a, a collection of cases that all have to do with vascular lesions and how the, how different insults to the vasculature of the pulmonary uh, or of, of the lung can result in different pathologies. And hopefully you'll see a spectrum of disease and you'll get a better sense for when to look at uh, vascular lesion and blow it off, which is what we do oftentimes with pulmonary arteries, and when to say, hey, that's a significant lesion, we really need to pay attention. Yeah, and, and, and I really think that, and you guys can call us on this if it ever happens, but it won't. In the non-tumoral area, when we're not talking about a tumor biopsy, there should never should be a tutorial that we do with you where we don't refer to the clinical, the laboratory, and the radiology as pretty much maybe even 80% of the case. So if we're doing a pathologist thing where we're jumping in on the pathology and, and talking about, wow, look at that, look at this, we failed. We failed you. We failed the patient. We want to get across that every one of these cases needs a deep dive for, from you into the other components that are not on the pathology slide. Yep, because the pathologist is perfectly suited, whether you believe this or not, you are perfectly suited to be the ideal person to perform a clinical pathologic and radiologic correlation and provide a very clear treatment directive for these patients. You yeah. may never write a script yourself in your life, but you are the one who is moving that hand and writing those scripts. So don't be afraid to embrace that. Right. Excellent. So this patient, 65-year-old male patient, comes to the pulmonologist's office, walks into the pulmonologist's office and says, you know, I just really haven't been feeling all that great lately. I have a little bit of a cough, a little bit of shortness of breath. It, you know, it's harder for me to get up my two flights of stairs at home compared to how it used to be. Um, I'm just not really feeling well. Malaise. Malaise, yeah. Fatigue. What's the pulmonologist going to do, Kevin? Well, I think the first thing they're going to do is, remember, the best pulmonologist is, of course, an internist, right? Because they are internists by training. And they're going to do a full analysis of the history, and they're going to do a physical exam, an EKG, and blood studies, right? They're going to get those things all going. But in the office, frequently the most powerful tool they have is just a simple chest x-ray. Yep. And you, you talk to a pulmonologist, they'll say, you know, I got to tell you, I, I'm, I consider myself really smart, but I really need that chest x-ray as part of my basic physical exam. So they get a chest x-ray on this guy. And what do you think it shows, Max? Uh, well, I'll tell you what it shows, but I think we, we our, our viewers can predict what it's going to show based on looking at this slide, right? This low power image, this chest x-ray is going to show multiple bilateral pulmonary nodules and they're going to be a variable size we're going to have some large ones and we're going to have some smaller pulmonary nodules yeah and those are hugely different in size the ones we see right here on the screen right and some of them may have some central cavitation that you might be able to appreciate on chest x-ray although sometimes it's difficult on chest x-ray right but these so, are be pretty small nodules. This is like, I'm thinking four millimeters. That well, big here's here's five, five millimeters right here. So it's about a centimeter. That's it's about a centimeter. Yeah. But I'll tell you, the imaging on this patient showed a whole range of different nodules, variable size, some of them with a little halo of ground glass around them. Now, if you're the pulmonologist and you look at this 
chest x-ray and then you look at the patient and you're holding chest x-ray patient chest x-ray patient there's something not making sense here because this chest x-ray looks horrible this patient's got tons of nodules central cavitation and yet the patient comes in and says i'm just not really feeling that great a little bit short of breath max cavitation is usually a sign of abscess exactly so and how much abscess do you need in the liver to be sick as a dog Exactly. So if this is infection, all of a sudden there's something really wrong with the way the patient's presenting and what we're seeing on the imaging studies. So pulmonologist goes forward, gets a high resolution CT scan, confirms this patient has multiple bilateral pulmonary nodules with cavitation, upper and lower lobes. Does a wedge biopsy for confirmatory diagnosis. And, and I presume all cultures done in advance of the biopsy, right? Blood yeah. cultures, lavage, bronch, all that stuff were negative. Bronchoscopy, bronchoscopy is non-diagnostic, cultures are negative still. And they're like, well, we got to figure out what these lesions are. So they did this wedge biopsy. So this, this wedge biopsy, like we said, very nodular. And if we look at the periphery of some of these nodules, you guys remember what this is when we talked about acute lung injury? I mean, this is a abundant accumulation of fibrin within the air spaces. And if our whole biopsy looked like this, some people would probably call this AFOP, acute fibrinous and organizing pneumonia, because there's tons of fibrin. All right, so we have this abundant fibrin here within the air spaces, and if we could, but we don't just have fibrin, it's surrounding this area of extensive necrosis. If we look closely, this is an area of extensive necrosis. And it looks kind of blue. It looks very blue. So what What's do you think up about with the low power image, Kevin? Well, I'm thinking that's a it's a spectacular image. It looks to me like something interstellar. What I see here is I see like a black hole at the center, and I see a ring of fire. That black fiber fire. like it's cuffing that black hole in the center. And whenever I see the ring of fire, I always think about kind of lymphoid things, you know, and lymphoid things with necrosis and a ring of fire. I always think about lymphoproliferative high grade lesions like and lymphomatoid granulomatosis and the lung. Exactly. Lymphomatoid granulomatosis would be number <laughs> one. But other things, diffuse large B cell lymphoma can also do this. T cell so, lymphomas can be vasculocentric and do things like this. Yeah. So, I mean, we're not trying to confuse you guys. Because this is not a lymphoma, but it does make you wonder when vascular things are lymphoid and immunologic, but not malignant. Interesting. Anyway, we'll get into that in a bit. So areas of necrosis, there's actually several different areas of necrosis in this biopsy. Some of them with peculiar shapes. Yes. They're not round. No, they look like, like characters. Yeah, like, like, a, like, like this looks like a wolf howling in the moon, right? Here's the head, his head's up, he's howling yeah. in the moon. Good one. Peculiar yeah. shapes. Here's another one. It's not a nice round area of necrosis. It's, it has a geographic appearance to it. Right. So when we look at higher power, we can appreciate that what we're dealing with here is a component of necrosis. Do you agree with that, Kevin? Yeah, oh, yeah. And it looks to me like, you know, I like to use the term dirty here only because for some reason it transmits to pathologists the notion of nuclear breakdown and the dusty appearance of nuclear breakdown. It looks like dirt on a floor. Exactly. So we've got a lot of these areas of necrosis. And you're right, it is cellular breakdown. And a lot of what these cells are that are breaking down are neutrophils. Yeah. Right? We have abundant neutrophils. It's almost like a sheet of neutrophils that are, that are breaking down into these sort of geographic type um, areas. And I want to go and look at this one in particular. So look at that. This area of necrosis. Now, some people will say, well, this looks like a granuloma. And I'd say we're like, where's all the giant cells? Have we seen a giant cell yet? I don't think so. 
I might have seen one isolated giant cell from low mag, a multinucleated cell, but I'm not really seeing a gathering of them. Like yeah. they're the, the, those are, they almost look like a like a isolated osteoclast like giant cell. Weird. Yeah. The giant cells are quite sparse. And when you find them, they're small. They're not these yeah. big, plump, epithelioid giant cells with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. They are small and dark and multinucleated and hyperchromatic. And, and kind of what, smoky. The cytoplasm looks a little smoky purple. Smoky purple. I, uh, I call these angry giant cells. They're not yeah. light, fluffy giant cells like you'd see in sarcoid. These are small, angry giant cells. Here's another giant it, cell here. Wow, in isolation. Look at that. All by itself. So and the nuclei so oh, dark. Yeah. Okay. Very dark. So we have this necrotizing process, sparse giant cells. The necrosis is basophilic. It's geographic. Many of you know where we're going with this. Just type into Google. Type those words you just said into Google. It'll, It'll give you the geographic necrosis and, you, and you'll be set. But the reason why I wanted to show this case within our deep dives of, of vascular lesions is that this case shows an unusual finding, actually, for this disease process. This disease process, usually you see the geographic basophilic necrosis, and that's it. You don't see this lesion. But this, in this case, we're actually cutting through this, the section of this lesion. So what is this? Artery. It's a pulmonary artery, and we're going to look at an elastic tissue stain to confirm that. And what's happening to this pulmonary artery? It looks like it's got granulation tissue in it. I mean, it looks like the wall is breaking down, and those look like new capillaries. And it just looks like, like the thing is almost a thrombotic, weird repair reaction. Exactly. And if we look at the elastic tissue stain, which, again, a standard workup for vascular lesions in the lung, you want to get an elastic tissue stain. It's a beautiful example. Here's your pulmonary oh. artery, dual layer of elastic, um, dual elastic layer. And what's wow. happening here? It's, we've lost the wall. It's gone. It's absolutely oh. been destroyed. So this that's, another, that's, that's another important fact we got to touch on here. If you think the patient, your patient has GPA, granulomatosis polyangiitis, the necrosis should destroy the tissue. In other words, you shouldn't be able to see the tissue behind the necrosis. You know how sometimes infarcted things, you can actually see the structure? Right. Inside, in, in GPA, the necrosis expands outward and destroys everything in its path on the way out. Exactly. And, and that's what we're seeing here. So this is a case of GPA. Um, but the differential for this, right, we, we did a top uh, 10 pearls on, um, on uh, necrotizing granulomas are almost always an infectious etiology, right? So yes. the differential for this is infection versus GPA. They both can involve the pulmonary vasculature, right? Right. So what are yep. the histologic features that help you distinguish infection versus granulomatosis with polyangitis? Cool. This would be a time when we could have like a bullet list show up on the slide. Number one, number maybe, two. Maybe we will. Future. So, although they both can involve the vessels, you'll notice that when infection involves the vessel, it usually is very granulomatous. And this is more vasculitic. This is a transmural de destructive process within the vessel. Right. Infection is... And granular infection... Go ahead. I was just going to say, infection is more likely to show a robust number of large, plump, epithelioid, multinucleated giant cells, as opposed to the small, rare, smoky ones we're seeing here on this case of granulomatosis with polyangitis. Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many cool lessons in GPA. You know, there's just so many cool clinical and radiologic things, you know, that actually can solve the case pretty easily. But then we don't get the fun of looking at a biopsy. You know, serology will often solve this problem. Right. But one of the things is, you know, I, I like to say, like, if you told somebody there's no burgers at Burger King. Right. You'd be like, come on. Pulling my I, leg. 
And full disclosure, I do not own stock in Burger King. But I will tell you that Wegener granulomatosis, which was the old name for this disease, granulomatosis with polyangitis, that term granulomatosis does not mean granuloma. In fact, I'll ask you this, Kevin, in your entire career, you've been practicing for a little while. Yeah, a few years. In your entire career, have, have you ever seen a well-formed granuloma in a case of granulomatosis with polyangitis? Never, but I have seen a case of GPA where the necrosis became secondarily infected with aspergillus. And that would be very difficult. <laughs> that, the Maybe we'll do that with case next. Yeah, we'll show you that one. So remember, any necrosis in the lung can attract aspergillus, right? Aspergillus is a saprophyte. It's, it's in the air. It gets into stuff, and it loves to hang out and grow in necrotic tissue. Right. And, so, and the last comment I want to make about distinguishing infection from GPA, we touched on a little bit at the presentation that this patient had. This patient walked into the pulmonologist's office, a little bit short of breath, cough, not feeling too well. If this lesion was infection and the patient had multiple bilateral infectious lesions, that patient would be sick in the ICU. That patient would not be walking into the pulmonologist's office. Exactly. And the necrosis in infection is much more often pink, not blue. And you can take that to the bank. Look at the next 10 infections you see in the lung with granulomatous inflammation. And the necrosis will be pink. So remember, vascular lesions and granulomatosis with polyangitis are rare. If you see them, that's great. They should not have robust, well-formed granulomas. If they do, then you probably want to think of, start thinking about infection instead of granulomatosis with polyangitis. In so, fact, I use the rule, if I think it's GPA, I hunt for a granuloma. If I find one granuloma, the diagnosis is in doubt. Not if GPA. I find two granulomas, it's not GPA. Exactly. And then what we do clinically, we ask for serologies, ANCA serologies, right? No PR3 specificity. Screen and, onco study. And patients, ninety percent of the time, will have disease within a hand's breadth of the tip of their nose before they present with their lung disease. That means chronic sinusitis, thick intranasal crusts, um, hemorrhagic crusts in the nose, uh, otitis, uh, hearing loss—all the stuff that you can reach with your hand around the tip of your nose. See, your hand is big enough to actually reach your middle ear yeah the other great thing to ask is what the patient's urinary sediment looks like excellent if they've done, if they've done a creatinine or if they've done a urinalysis because these patients often will have renal involvement and they'll have an active urinary sediment and in fact if you present with radiology like this patient did and you have an active urinalysis you probably don't even need to do a biopsy of either organ you probably Correct. need to treat presumptively as GPA, especially if the patient has a positive onca. Right. Okay. Cool. okay. Well, I think we kind of, uh, we completed everything we wanted to on this case. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it and you're enjoying this deep dive of uh, pulmonary vascular lesions. And uh, don't forget to like and comment below. Thanks a lot.